Hey, thanks for joining me on this uh, part two of my skeleton cave adventure. I've been wanting to come here for at least 10 years. And basically what this is, this was a massacre site or a battle site in the Apache Wars. Don't remember the exact date, but it would be in the late 1800s, probably 1870s. I'll tell you in a minute though, when I get the big book out. Uh, but what we have is a cave behind us or a big rock shelter with a cliff above it. And we're a long, long ways off the river bottom in the middle of nowhere. The Apache tribe that came here, they were hiding out from the U.S. Army. Uh, they thought they were safe because it's so difficult to get here. But the U.S. Army hired some other Apaches that knew exactly where this was, and they led them right here. The soldiers broke up into two parties. One came around the side of the hill, the same path basically that I took coming up here in the first part of this video, and others stood on the top of this cliff behind me, and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. And what they did, and they did this right around dawn or just before dawn, and when the sun was bright enough to attack, they started firing up into the cave at anything that moved, man, woman, or child, it didn't matter. Um, and the people on top uh, were firing down, but they also realized that they could just push rocks off the top and crush the Apache Indians below. And a lot of them died that way. Uh, so it's, a, it's a really kind of a, a horrific area. Um, a lot of bad juju here. I think it's very important that people like you and me can come and visit sites like this. And I don't understand why the government feels that they can't tell people where things are. You know, granted, uh, people may come up here scavenging, looking for things. And trust me, it's been scavenged. <laughs> I mean, uh, 20 years after the battle, this was rediscovered. And they said when they first came into this cave, there were skeletons and bones and skulls everywhere, just scattered right where they fell. Uh, you know, the soldiers didn't do anything to them, didn't bury them or, or anything like that. And the, the survivors, of course, weren't able to do that because they hauled them away uh, to the reservation almost immediately. And there are pictures online uh, where you can see, uh, you know, the skulls and stuff laying everywhere. And uh, it's kind of gruesome, but... This is, again, this is called Skeleton Cave uh, or Skull Cave. It might have one other name too, but I'll put some links for you in, in the video description so you can see. All right, let me grab the camera. I'm gonna show you the cliff I'm talking about where they push the rocks over, and then we're gonna go into the cave together for the very first time. This is the actual cave, which is more like a rock shelter that goes back underneath, and they're protected from uh, you know the rain and the elements. Now the soldiers came around the side of the hill just like we did in, in part one of this video and they were all down through here probably on both sides and they were firing up into this cave and the indians had piled up rocks all along the front as like a breastworks that they could hide behind and they were relatively safe from the bullets but there was a problem their breastworks or fortifications were actually out far enough that the uh, soldiers and the Indian scouts on top of the hill behind me could roll rocks over down onto them and crush them. And a lot of the, a lot of the Indian braves uh, and fighters got crushed just by, by the falling rocks. And the soldiers would push the rocks over and they'd come tumbling, tumbling down, and they would fall onto the men, women, and children and crush them to death. Other soldiers were down here firing up into this cave. Uh, the, the women and the children were hiding in the back, which, as it turned out, it was a death trap. I'm gonna show you why in just a minute. Let's go down and take a look at it. Okay, we're gonna walk down here together. I'll have to try to watch my step. It's very slippery. <laughs> we're a long ways away from uh, where any of the soldiers were, would have been active in their campaigning. And the Indians thought they were safe here, and they would have been if it hadn't been for the scouts that uh, turned on them. There were actually some photographs of this site that were taken about 20 years after the battle, uh, when the whites first, well, found this place again, and they came in, took pictures, and there are skeletons and bones and stuff just laying everywhere in here, um, because, of course, they didn't have time to bury the, the uh, fallen. They just left them lay because uh, soldiers, you know, they didn't want to be bothered with it. And the, the family members that survived, the women and children anyway, you know, they couldn't 
do that because the soldiers wouldn't let them, I guess. All right, let's keep moving down here. I'm watch out for rattlesnakes. So I could hear some marmots up there on the hillside whistling at us. That means there's plenty of food for rattlesnakes here. So just picture yourself here 120 years ago with an Indian tribe. There was over 100 people uh, sheltered in here. Uh, they had run away from the reservation and the soldiers were chasing them. And they thought they were perfectly safe. It would be a heck of a place to try to live for weeks on end while you're hiding out. Here's some graffiti. 1949, Ireland, 32, 1932. Some older stuff, 59. Apaches killed, 1872. So Ponson Hayward, 1927, 1980. So we're in the middle of an area right now that was a death zone for the Indian warriors, the women, and the children. There's no escaping the bullets of the, of the soldiers and the Indian scouts. I'm gonna tell you why in just a minute. See the plant right there? That means the water was dripping down out of there, or is does drip out of there, um, at least occasionally. So maybe at the time they were able to get some water when they were up here, didn't have to go down to the river. And we just walked through the site of the battle and the horrific suffering that took place right here. The problem with this shelter is that it was great as long as they didn't find you. <laughs> but once they found you, there was really no, no surviving because as it turned out, you could hide back in here. You didn't have to work. Oh, you didn't, I'm gonna show you something in a minute I, I see from here. You didn't have to hide. I mean, you could hide from the rocks above you could probably, you would think you'd be able to defend yourself from attacking um, Indians or soldiers because it's a very, very strong position. But what they didn't count on was that the bullets, when they were fired in here, would hit the roof right here and they would ricochet down. So even though the children and the women could hide back in here and not be in direct fire. They couldn't hide from the bullets that were hitting the ceiling and going down into them. Thump, thump, thump. Uh, only, not only the metal, but the rock fragments. So that killed a lot of the, the uh, family members, the, the youngsters and, and the women. And if it hadn't been for that, they may have, may have been able to hold out here um, and would have survived. But the soldiers figured it out that by firing up here at the roof, they could kill everyone that was inside, and they proceeded to do so. And the Apaches wanted to fight to the death, and they pretty much did. Most of them died. I'm going to read you some accounts from a book I have that uh, uh, the accounts were written by, you know, first person. Um, well, by people that were actually here and witnessed it or took part of it. But let me show you something out there first. And if you look at this world cactus right in front of the cave, I think those are bullet holes. Well, I know those are bullet holes. I can only um, suspect that that may have been from the actual battle that took place here. But I can't say for sure, but those are definitely bullet holes. Isn't that wild? Let's go down and take a look at them. So I'm down below the cave now to give you a different perspective on it. You can see the giant swirl cactuses have what appear to be bullet holes on this side as well. So that kind of leads me to believe that's, that's exactly what it is. Uh, the water would pour off the top there, you know, when it rains real hard and wash down through here and down over the side and on down to the river. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? 
what I want to do now, what I want to do now is walk over to this ridge where I think probably the soldiers were firing from to give us a perspective of what the, uh, what the cave looked like from there and how little protection it actually afforded uh, the Apaches. We're almost there. All right, this is the perspective that the attacking soldiers and Apache scouts would have had. I'm right up standing on the ridge looking into the cave. So even though uh, the, uh, the Apache tribe had, had made rock fortifications in front of there, you can see how exposed they were to rifle fire just by the ricochets off the roof. They were not expecting to be found here. Again, uh, the army would never have found them here if they hadn't had uh, scouts lead the way. It was a very exposed position and there was certainly no way out for them except uh, via surrender or death. And the majority chose death. Remember what I said about accidentally walking into things? I just walked into that cactus and looked at my pants. That's why you never ever wear shorts in the desert out here. If I hadn't had these on, they would be in my leg big time. And they'll keep working their way through that cloth too. And ah, do they do it till they get in my leg? I got at least one little one in there. And we'll look at that later. You wonder if those are bullet strikes as well. You can see whether some chunks are taken out of it. Could very well be. All right, let's go back over there and uh, I'll just tell you a little bit more about it. And here's the cave from a slightly different perspective. That's the river down below. You can just picture the soldiers on that crest right there. And probably on that crest over there, firing down into the cave where everyone was huddled up in a big pile. A shelter like this would be important to, uh, to get out of the sun. That's my gear over there. I'm gonna go ahead and grab a little lunch uh, and then sit here a minute. And I'm gonna read to you a few of the uh, first person accounts of the soldiers who are actually here. And maybe even um, some of the accounts of the first party that came in here uh, from the railroad party of whites that came in here from the railroad about 20 years after the battle and what they saw it's really interesting looks like they're coming back for the check I'm sitting here in the cave though I'm not sure what kind of helicopter that is I'll zoom in for you It's a heavy lift helicopter. Kind of weird looking, isn't it? Looks prehistoric. I'd like to read to you now uh, from this book uh, about the Apaches by uh, Peter Cossens. And what it is, it's a collection of first person accounts, people that were actually here uh, and witnessed this fight or took part in this fight. This was written by an anonymous soldier in the 5th U.S. Cavalry. And again, this took place in 1872. And I'm going to pick up about halfway through his letter. He's already talked about um, journeying to this spot across the desert uh, under the guide of a friendly Apache and several Pima uh, Indian scouts. And this is what he had to say about the fight. The main body was halted and Lieutenant Ross with an Indian guide and 15 men followed the trail of the returning Apaches toward the stronghold. And in less than one half a mile, the guide signaled halt and whispered, Apache. Now they were actually following a small band of Apaches that they had discovered about a, some distance, mile distance or whatever, that were coming back from a raid. And they had some horses and some other things and they had, had left the horses uh, back a ways and hiked in on foot and the soldiers were following them at night. This was like around midnight and the guide signaled halt and whispered Apache. 
Then he, together with Lieutenant Ross and two scouts, crept along to a turn in the trail and looking around saw the Apache stronghold about 35 yards in front. Now this is that little area where we first stopped when I first started making this video. 35 yards is a very, very short distance, especially for a rifle. But again, it was still dark at this point. So it continues. It was a long, wide open cave and a few yards in front of it was a rampart of huge blocks of stone, a natural fortification, but probably added to by the Apaches. Just at the outside of the cavern, a fire was burning and a band of Indians were dancing and singing around it, evidently celebrating their bloody raid through the Gila settlements. Again, they just came back from a raid, some of the, uh, the Apache braves. A few of the women were cooking a meal, and a number of the Indians could be seen sitting in the cave and watching the dance. The men were whispered forward by Lieutenant Rost and sent a volley into the dancers, several falling dead. They just blasted into the dancers as they were having their little party. The others at once rushed to the cave or manned the rampart, and in less than three minutes opened fire upon the soldiers whom they could just get a glimpse of in the early dawn. And at this moment, Lieutenant Bork, whose account I'm going to read in just a few minutes, so just a small portion of it, with between 40 or 50 men, came in at the double down the rocky trail, just in time to save Ross and his handful of men from a counterattack, Major Brown having rushed them forward at the moment the first volley was fired. Lieutenants Bork and Ross hastily posted their men so as to cut off retreat by the Apaches by either flank, and when Major Brown came up with the rest of the men, they surrounded the Indians, the cave being under an unclimbable cliff. So again, they're on the left side over here where we first came in, and on the other side over there where we took that little walk before we started this little read. <laughs> the men therefore fired volley after volley at the roof and the effects were soon seen. A number of Indians then made a determined charge, one party at the front and the other at the right flank, while still another party mounted their rampart and fired rapidly, evidently trying to help out the charges, which, however, were repulsed with much loss to the Indians, and several of those on the rampart were also killed. The troops then commenced firing volleys into the cave, and at this time, Captain Burns, with his troop came up on the cliff above the cave. It was impossible to get down to attack the Apaches below, so they started rolling rocks down upon them. The Indians, however, still continued defiant, singing and yelling. After some little time, it was plainly seen that the end was near. The death song had died away, and Major Brown, after assigning Captain Burns to hold up rolling rocks, ordered a charge. And after it was over, not a warrior was left alive, except some mortally wounded. And this charge, however, one Apache did get away. He must have thrown himself flat upon the ground, and in the midst of the charge, wormed his way through. But then he considered himself safe, and could not resist leaping upon a high rock and giving a yell of defiance, which brought a shot from Blacksmith Cahill of the pack train, which killed the Indian at 800 yards. Between 80 and 90 Indians were killed in this fight. So let me read to you another letter that this was written by Lieutenant Bork and is titled the Salt River Cave Fight. I'm just going to read you one paragraph. This is when they were actually attacking this cave, the cave that I'm sitting in right now. A charge was now ordered and their men rushed forward. Upon entering the enclosure, a horrible spectacle was disclosed to view. In one corner, 11 dead bodies were huddled and another four, and in different crevices there were piled to the extent of the little cave and the total number of 57. 76 altogether were killed in this fight, and 20 women and children were taken prisoners. The spoils, very considerable in quantity, were destroyed. We found mescal, baskets, seeds, hides, skins, and the material usually composing the outfit of these savage nomads. <laughs> Our captives were nearly all wounded, more or less severely, but 
By good fortune, we succeeded in bringing them off in safety. One of our Pima allies was killed, but with this exception, no losses occurred. So the soldiers and the attacking Indian scouts only lost one person, and pretty much the majority of the Apache Indians who were in this cave uh, were killed or wounded very badly, including the women and children. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to take another little walk around this cave and show you a few things I discovered uh, since I had my lunch and sat down to read to you from this book. <laughs> this is my favorite book, by the way. Whenever I come out west, uh, especially here to Arizona, I bring this book and I read from it uh, as much as possible, especially by the light of the campfire. It's just, um, it's spiritual to me. So anyway, let me show you a few things that, well, kind of horrifying because I am surrounded by the bones of those Apaches. I mean, I can see them laying everywhere. <laughs> it's kind of horrible. Uh, and like I said, they took away most of the bones and uh, reburied them. The, uh, the Apache Indians had tried long after this battle. I mean, decades and decades after this battle. Uh, but they didn't get them all, apparently. So let me show you a few things that... Um, I can see in front of me. I'm not digging or anything like that. I'm just walking around looking. So as they were standing right here dancing uh, late into the night, the soldiers crept around this hill right there. And that's where they opened fire upon the, uh, upon the people who were standing right where I am. And as soon as they did that, the Apaches went to grab their rifles and the soldiers split up. Some of them came around here and worked their way down across the bottom and lined themselves up on that slope over there. So you had a bunch of them over there and a bunch of them right here. And according to what we just read, that's only 35 yards away. I mean, I could hit someone with a rock easily at that distance. They started shooting them right here as they were doing their victory dance from their recent raids. And the rest took place all around us. That's where I was sitting where I was reading from the book and I had the tripod on that little hill. And as I was sitting there, <laughs> I could look in front of me and see bones in this dirt. I mean, it's just loaded with fragments. Um, I know they took out the uh, bigger long bones, but that's, that's a bone, human bone. And if you look up here, you can see some more. Look, this is a bone too. That's uh, almost 100% uh, likely to be a bone from one of the Apaches that was killed here. And there's just a lot of them scattered in here, just little pieces. There's some cloth that, that could be later, I don't know, but looks old, doesn't it? I'll cover that up too. Um, it's just fragments everywhere, lots of fragments. In this area right here where I set my gear, I looked up on the shelf and you see there's more bone fragments here. These were probably picked up and put there by a hiker. But if you look down here, this is loaded with stuff too. Um, there's some fragments here. These are some of the Apache Indian uh, that were killed here. And there's some worked rocks. Now these could have been done a thousand years before the Apaches came here. These were where they would have taken chert or flint and made spear points or knives um, or arrow points or anything like that. Again, that could very well be long before the Apaches because these the Apaches here were armed with rifles. They weren't using bows and arrows. And I also noticed on the rocks where we first looked at the, um, the signatures that were in here that there is actually a bullet hole in the rock. I looked around inside and it's really hard to tell if there's any bullet holes because a rock is not very smooth. So it just chips off and after 100 years, uh, you know, you just can't tell anymore. But I just noticed on this flat spot here, there's several bullet holes here. This isn't even the ones I'm going to show you. Uh, but you can see this is a bullet hole for sure, no doubt. And there's one there too. Look, there's one there and one that could be one. Not positive, there may be two there, but there's at least three right there, bullet splatters. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you the ones, or the one that was up here that I originally saw, just because, well, 
I'll go show you. I want to show you that one. I think if we looked around, we'd see a lot more of them. And here's the signatures that we looked at when we first came in. And if you look right there, that's a bullet hole for sure. Right there. And there's probably a lot more around here. But, I mean, we've already found four or five that were easy to see. Again, most of them would be very, very hard to see in a rock like this that's all uh, kind of friable because it would just chip off and, and you wouldn't be able to see it after 120 years or whatever. I'm not a math wizard. I did want to touch on one other little thing while I'm here. Um, yeah, I'm real happy to see that, although though there's some graffiti and unfortunately some that's not too old, there's not a lot of trash. I did see a few pieces of uh, cans and whatnot that normally I would take out, but since we're on government land, if it's more than 50 years old, um, that could be a felony. So I'm not going to touch anything that I don't know how old it is. But I want to show you something here that kind of saddens me a little bit. And I think it might sadden you too. At least I hope it does. And I hope it makes you think in the future. I'm still in the mouth of the cave right here. And if you look, you can see where, you know, someone was eating nuts and apparently just spitting them out on the ground. Um, although this is natural, though not native to this area, and you would think that it's not a big deal, but I can just picture someone standing here, pumping away, you know, just spitting them out, you know, and they're spitting them on top of Apache Indian bones. I mean, they're mixed in with, with, the, with the nuts, and that's just kind of horrifying to me. I can't believe it. Look, that's a fragment of bone right there. just mixed in with the nuts what are what are people thinking they should have a little respect you know they really should again i mean it's not horrible it's just i'm just envisioning this person sitting here just spitting them out on top of the bones <sighs> here's a little piece of trash that was left here too that's a can lid but again if that's 50 years old my age it would be a felony for me to take that out of here, so I am not going to pick it up as trash. I'll have to leave it, just to be safe. I'm just working my way around the inside wall here, and you can see there's uh, lots of bone. There's another chunk there. There's a big piece there, too, look. And this is right where, uh, in those letters that I read you, The uh, women and children were all huddled in here, right against these walls, and uh, the bullets were just raining in on them. There was no escaping it. They were trapped. There's a cave right there, and I was working my way along this slope, trying to get in position where I, I thought the soldiers might have been, and I just discovered a uh, strewn field, so to say, of bones. This looks like a vertebrae here. Put it back in there. Another chunk of bone there. And as I was looking down the hill here, I can see more bones. Look. Another piece there. That's a joint. I thought we'd just wander down here a little bit. Here's some more bleached bones. more fragments there there's a big one up in there that's some type of I don't know maybe you bone people can tell me what that would go to it's not very long is it maybe it's a mountain goat I doubt it though there's some more there Looks like it's shattered. That's probably from the weathering. There's another big one here. Look. So I'm positioned now where I would have think the soldiers would have been hunkered down behind the rocks. You see the river's way down there. 
I'm thinking these rocks would have made very good protective barriers to fire into the cave over there. It's only about 150 yards, 200 at the most. Uh, there could have been some soldiers like up on these rocks too, probably, firing down into it. Man, I don't know how you would hide. I guess you couldn't. <laughs> and uh, the bone spill that I found was, was going down through there. So let's wander up here and get a, a vantage point from that area before we go. Just to give you a view from how we came up here. Uh, my boat is right, right down there at the very bottom. And we came up through that ravine over there and up that flattish area, which is actually really steep. And then we climbed up the rocks until we hit that face. Then we followed the face around and somehow ended up in this area and came across the loose rock and then dropped down into the cave. Now, there's crystals, sticky up crystals. I suppose you guys have heard of pack rats. And pack rats are found in the desert. One of the things they do is they'll like take stuff and they'll pack it away. <laughs> but they'll steal stuff from you too when you're camping. Uh, little shiny things and just anything. They'll drag it back to their uh, den. And there's a pack rat den here I wanted to show you. And that's a pack rat den. And you see what they do is they pack it full of cactus thorns. And that keeps out predators like no bobcat or coyote or fox is going to dig in there to try to get to their nest. Oh, bone down here. Look at this. Oh, there he is. He didn't make it. <laughs> and I have to warn you too when you're out here, especially this year, is that uh, there are pack rats, well not the pack rats so much as the prairie dogs, uh, carry bubonic plague of all things, bubonic plague. So you don't want to mess around with those prairie dogs and maybe pack rats, I don't know. Because uh, you can, you know, die of the Black Death. <laughs> I mean, people do every year. I shouldn't laugh. Uh, you know, here in the desert, uh, you know, the western part of the U.S. Uh, does kill people. So you don't mess around with a bunch of uh, prairie dogs or other rodents like that. I just discovered this bone here. This is a bird bone. It's really, really light. So I started looking around. And I can see there's a bunch of bird droppings on the rocks there. And it looks like some branches or something. So I'm wondering if there's some type of nest up there. Uh, maybe not. Or maybe it's not active right now. But maybe it's an old one. I'm thinking about going up there and looking. You want to go look? I think we can just kind of scoot along here without too much trouble. And then I wanted to go look over that rock there. See those jumbled rocks right there? It's kind of unusual. I don't know. It could be natural, but I'm thinking it might not be. So we'll go look at that too. Well, I did climb up there and look, and I don't see any sign of a nest. It's just bare rock. I'm not going to go over to that one. I mean, I think I can make it without too much problem, but I'm a long ways from being rescued. <laughs> My wife uh, has instructions not to call anyone uh, until tomorrow night. She doesn't hear from me before tomorrow night. Uh, she knows right where to send them. So, but still, I don't want to lay out here for two days with a broken back or broken legs. So we'll pass on that, what do you say? <laughs> oh, wow, that's beautiful, beautiful, cool air. I have to go back out in the sun now. I just love Arizona. This is a very interesting rock. See all these nodules? I believe those are iron or manganese nodules. And uh, that's where your black sand comes from when that decomposes. Huh. Pretty sure anyway. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me here today. Um, this was a very special uh, trip for me. I've been wanting to come here for a long time. I would like to give a shout out to the YouTube channel, um, Hiking Arizona, or it might be hikingarizona.com on another site. I can't remember exactly, uh, but it was the guy that gives enough direction that you can actually find the place. I was hoping to get together with him out here, but uh, I wrote him about two weeks ago, but he never wrote back, so uh, I did it by myself, which is fine. Uh, all right, well, thanks for hanging out with me. We'll see you down the road, that I can promise you.
I made it back to my boat with plenty of light to spare. I'm dying of thirst and I'm so hot I can't stand it. But there's water here. Cool, clear water. Well, it's really green. But I'm going to strip down nude and jump in for a while. And off we go. Man, that was an awesome trip. That was worth the drive. All 36 hours of behind the wheel at 65 miles an hour. <laughs> we'll see you in the next one.